Um, yeah, so uh, Kellen told you about experimental philosophy uh, earlier today. Um, another way to think of it is that uh, we want to test uh, old philosophical hypotheses uh, empirically. So the talk today is, uh, is not an empirical talk, though it will draw on some of my empirical work uh, in order to undermine an old position in philosophy. Uh, and then I view for a particular view um, that I hold within philosophy. So, um, okay. Uh, so, um, the position, I'm going to say a bit more about this given your diverse background, but the position that I'm going to argue against uh, on the basis of uh, some data from synesthesia uh, is called representationalism. Uh, which is a particular view in philosophy of minds, uh, and uh, as I will explain, is different from a representational view of perception. Um, it actually ends up being a kind of quality of view, which I'll also say a bit more about, uh, and there are two uh, major problems for uh, the quality of view. One is uh, the so-called problem of privatism, um, which we'll talk a bit about, and uh, then there's what I call the quality of freak objection, uh, which I'll then also talk about. Okay, so uh, representationalism in philosophy is associated with uh, a guy from UT Austin, Michael Tai, uh, and also uh, Fred Dretzky. I'm focusing here on um, Michael Tai, doesn't really matter. Uh, it is the view that um, that visual experience, or experience uh, in general, but I'll focus on the visual case, uh, has uh, what we could call a phenomenology. Uh, the phenomenology is sort of uh, the conscious part of the experience, what it's like uh, for you to have the experience. It also has, uh, at least uh, on this view, a concept. Uh, the concept you can think of as the what the experience conveys uh, when you have the experience, right? So if you're seeing a red tomato, then there's something is like uh, for you to see the tomato, there's a redness and the richness of the, of the perception, uh, but presumably there's also some content to it, uh, which is uh, the, the tomato and its shape and its redness and so on. Now, representationalism, this particular view, uh, is the view that, um, that phenomenology is something that's weird. Phenomenology is, is this what it is like to have the experience. It seems very subjective. It's not something you can really study in, in science. Uh, so wouldn't it be nice to, if we could reduce that to something that is not really phenomenal? but this just has to do with objects and properties. So the idea is basically that, um, that the phenomenology of an experience is reducible to its concepts. So, so uh, what is its content? Well, it represents the tomato and the redness in that case. So the content would be something like the tomato's red or uh, maybe some uh, image of that, but it would be uh, it wouldn't be the uh, phenomenal feel of the experience, rather the phenomenal feel of the experience is something that would flow from the content. So there's this reduc uh, reductive aspect of the position. Now why is that different from a representational view? Well, a representational view is really uh, an umbrella term for a number of different views uh, that just takes experience to be representational. And it can be contrasted with a relational view, uh, sometimes called naive uh, realism, where you stand in a direct relation to the external environment. So there's not this representational element involved. So coming out of the tradition of uh, sort of cognitive neuroscience, the representational view was default but not in philosophy of perception. A lot of people have defended uh, naive realism. So, so I'm a defender of a representational view of perception, but I don't think that the reductive view 
um, and this is the correct view. So this is the view that I'm going to argue against. I'm going to use theta in this particular argument from the case of synesthesia, which is something that I have studied over many years. Um, and I'm not assuming that you're familiar with this, so just very, very basic. Um, synesthesia is described as a mixing of the senses. Uh, of course, this is atypical experience, and it's a bit misleading to talk about a mixing of the senses. Uh, the classical case, of course, is uh, when you can hear the colors. For instance, you, uh, you hear music, but you hear uh, the music or uh, a particular uh, tone as red or as blue. Uh, so that would be one type of synesthesia. But sometimes it's not a mixing of the senses, sometimes it's within the same uh, sensory domain. Uh, so a particular common form of synesthesia is called uh, graphene color synesthesia. And in graphene color synesthesia, people are actually seeing, uh, in some sense of seeing, black letters, black numbers as colors. So the numbers and letters are printed in black, but they're seeing them uh, as, uh, as colors, as having specific colors. And you can actually test for this if you want to talk more about the methodology of this. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in Q&A. Um, so synesthesia is, is uh, very well tested. So here's a child subject of ours uh, that we have measured. Actually, we can add another um, two years. We just don't have it on this particular slide. Uh, but <coughs> this was a case where we actually uh, started very early on uh, at the age of three. And now uh, we actually will have here until the age of nine, but it's actually up until the age of 11. Um, and as you can see, this is just for the, the, uh, the person in question also has it for the letters, uh, but this is just for, for the numbers. Um, so at the age of three, you can see that, um, uh, that one is blue and it stays consistent, right? So one is seen by that, seen in, again in, in, in some uh, sense of C, is seen as, as, uh, as blue, uh, pretty consistently, right? Or in actually, in this case, uh, fully consistently. Not so for zero, uh, nothing at age three, nothing at age four, then it's gold, uh, gold, and then it becomes blue um, at age seven. Uh, the other ones are pretty consistent two, three, four, five, uh, six, uh, black, black, dark brown, dark brown, brown. Uh, and then black, black. So there can be some variation, but it's fairly consistent. Uh, and for seven, eight, and nine as well. So that's sort of one of the features uh, we can call a test, retest for liability or consistency. Um, and this is for a kind of synesthesia that develops uh, in early childhood, or perhaps at birth. Um, there are other forms of synesthesia that I'm also studying. In fact, I'm studying those more extensively uh, at the present moment. So some people uh, develop synesthesia after uh, hurting their heads or after a stroke. Um, and other people have synesthesia temporarily after taking psilocybin, uh, which is the active ingredient in uh, magic mushrooms or LSD, uh, and and we're doing a little bit. We're starting to do a little bit of, of those studies. Uh, they're uh, Schedule One substances, so they're a little harder to get approved. The experiments for those. Um, now there are two uh, types, uh, main types of um, of uh, this graphene color synesthesia. Um, one is called associator synesthesia. Um, now, associator synesthesia is not just associating, say, the number two with a particular color. It's uh, just as, um, as consistent over time, and it's not, it's not voluntary, and so on. Uh, but here we did a, a functional um, MRI of an associator. 
And uh, this is just to contrast that with what I'm call, going to call projector synesthesia in a moment. Uh, because what this shows is that um, the visual cortex is actually not the areas uh, of that are that are active in the uh, in the functional MI when uh, when this particular associated synesthesia was was tested. Rather, it's areas mostly in parietal cortex, uh, some little bit in the frontal areas, and some areas. Uh, in the in the temple um, temple lobes, and just to uh, get the resting resting state here, um, so you can see the contrast. So just going back. Um, so so this is this is clearly not um, fully visual in the neurological sense because it, it doesn't really activate visual cortex, despite actually involving things like color and um, Sorry to interrupt, but what was the subject doing? When oh, so in, the, in this particular this particular subject uh, was is a, is has uh, a response to mathematical formulas. So in this particular case, uh, the person was viewing mathematical formulas, and this is uh, a case where the person is reporting having uh, colored geometrical patterns in response to mathematical formulas. And the contrast or the control was, was uh, like a set of, of non-inducing formulas, so basically nonsense formulas. So, so this is showing only a correlation, right? So there's a correlation between uh, the inducing uh, formulas and, and the, the color geometry um, experience that resulted from that. So this is only showing a correlation, not a, not a causal relation. Um, like this is just some of the areas that were um, activated in, uh, in the active condition. So as I, as I mentioned, uh, not, not the visual cortex, but uh, rival cortex, uh, frontal cortex, uh, and uh, some areas of the um, temporal lobe. Now, we also did, um, we do, did do uh, um, TMS, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, in this particular case. Uh, and and that's, that's a technique that can be used in different ways. You can use it to, uh, to activate uh, people's uh, uh, outer, the outer areas of, of uh, people's brains, but you can also use it to inhibit. Um, you can cause what we call a virtual lesion in people. So Tony Rowe from CUNY has used it to uh, induce blind sights by applying it over areas of visual cortex, so inhibiting areas of visual cortex uh, in a normal subject, and so inducing something like blind sight, uh, it's really just adding uh, noise to the neural signals. And as you can imagine, if you just add maybe a little bit of noise, uh, then you might actually stimulate. But if you're adding a lot of noise, then you might confuse the brain cells, and that's when you inhibit. That's sort of uh, at least one story about that. Um, what we did here was that we uh, inhibited. Uh, so we were trying to see if we could um, inhibit the areas that we found that we identified in the uh, brain imaging, uh, and then inhibit, we inhibited them using TMS uh, to see if his uh, synesthesia then would dimin diminish. And this is uh, getting closer to showing something like a causal relation was with uh, the standard MI, functional MI uh, brain imaging, you get something more like correlations. Um, I'm mostly bringing in this case to contrast it later with the projector case. Another feature of, why is it not moving? Uh, seems like it's, okay, so it's on hold. Uh, let me uh, let me talk through the the next slide. It's um, 
I don't know why it's freezing up here. Um, hope it's not continuing problem. Um, okay. Okay, keep, keep doing, doing it. Let me talk through um, the, the next slide. Um, so, oh, there we go. Uh, perfect. So here you can see, um, is this is a, um, a typical exercise to, uh, uh, that, that uh, you also get associators to, um, to respond positively to. So in this case, you can see that uh, the same letter can be an A or an H. So you have cat or you have the. Uh, so the cat. And, uh, and then the H, of course, should be associated with, uh, with a unique color for uh, a particular synesthete. Uh, and the letter A should be associated with a different unique color for, uh, uh, for the synesthete. Um, and, and that is indeed the case. And uh, what that shows is that presumably this is not a low level kind of perception because the person has to interpret this as an A or as an H. It's not, in other words, if the person just responded to the, the shape of the H or the A, um, the same colors should emerge. But in this case, it's diff different colors emerge, and that's uh, another indicator that uh, it's a form of associator synesthesia. Now, what you um, what you get, what's interesting, you sometimes get it with associators too, but you definitely get it with projectors. So let me just say what projectors are compared to the associators. For the associators, uh, these connections, though they are still involuntary, consistent, and so on, are sort of uh, inside the person's mind. Uh, whereas in the projector case, uh, it's really projected out into the world. So if you see uh, the number two and you're a projector and you see that as green, uh, the green will be projected out into the world in different ways that we'll talk about. Um, what you get is, um, you find the Stroop effect in this case. So now, this is just sort of the, the standard Stroop effect, or examples of what you could use as stimuli for the Stroop effect. Uh, so if you take, take blue, so the word spelled blue, but it's represented or as, as red, um, and, or the word red is represented as, uh, as green, uh, you can do different uh, tests on subjects, uh, so you can measure uh, how quickly they, they can mention them, or read them, or comprehend them, uh, or you could, uh, you could measure accuracy, so uh, if you flash them really quickly, you can see how accurate will they be if you have, say, uh, the word blue that's just black, the standard black, or, or the word blue that's actually printed in blue, as opposed to blue printed in red. And the idea is that you get uh, either the response time uh, will be uh, slower for when you have this uh, incongruent representation uh, compared to the normal case, or you'll have uh, more mistakes in those cases. So that's basically the Stroop effect. Now, uh, you can also get the Stroop effect uh, with synesthesia, so that would be uh, slightly, slightly differently, but you basically would, would create an incongruent uh, situation where uh, instead of uh, taking the, uh, the standard colors of letters or, or words, uh, you would take the, the synesthetic colors to see if that, those colors interfere with, uh, say, response time or, or accuracy. Uh, so that's another test that's commonly done, and it shows up in particular in projectors and synesthetes, the ones that actually project up um, into, into the world. Another thing that's common for projector synesthetes, though it's not uh, consistent, but it has been found in projector synesthetes by uh, Ramachandran, uh, who's one of the first ones who did it, is that you, you uh, 
you contrast, say, you, you, you uh, give the, um, the pattern um, uh, on the left uh, to uh, at the control, and then you measure, or to a number of controls, and then you measure how long it will take them to find the pattern. Uh, you can make more complicated things than this one, of course. And it takes them a certain. It takes takes a little while if you haven't seen it before to actually identify the the uh, the triangle of twos among the fives. Uh, whereas for if you take a projector, so let's say it's a projector that has uh, that sees fives as green, and then the projector also sees the um, the twos as reds, and it really is projected out like this. Then, um, if you look at the figure on the right, that's what it should look like uh, for them, if it's very vivid, and if they are field projectors. And because it should look like something like that to them, um, it should take them um, no time to find the, the shape. Right? So you can contrast that with the control group, and, and um, and so you can make more complicated um, visual search uh, experiments that, uh, that we have also done uh, later on where we found that not all projectors actually uh, uh, respond to this in, in this way. But, but at least um, in the clear cases, they do. Now, these are, uh, there's uh, been a number of studies of uh, what's going on in projector synesthesia. And uh, in projector synesthesia, so I showed you the case of associated synesthesia where it lo doesn't look like it's, uh, it's a visual cortex that's involved uh, or as a neural correlates uh, for synesthesia, but uh, in these studies, which uh, we haven't completed, they have they been done many, many years ago, and uh, people have also done so recently. Uh, what happens is that um, there is an unusual connection, apparently a projection, uh, directly from um, from the uh, the form area, uh, which is close to the uh, the color area in the brain, so there is an unusual projection from form to color area, and um, and that's sort of that direct projection that's supposed to give rise to projective synesthesia. Um, it's it's not the case that all projector synesthetes actually have that particular mechanism as uh, the underlying mechanism, but uh, this has at least been shown in some recent uh, functional MRI studies that, uh, that that is what is going on in many cases of projector synesthesia. Um, this is, uh, let's get uh, through that, uh, but one thing that, that has been suggested on several occasions is that um, when you have uh, an interpretation of a number, I told you before that sometimes you need to interpret a letter as an H or shape, as a letter H or as a letter A, which would not take place in lower areas of the brain, it would probably take place in areas of the parietal cortex, but then in order to get uh, the color experience, you would think that there would have to be something like cognitive penetration, which is a kind of um, uh, feedback into the visual cortex. Uh, but in these particular cases, where there's a direct connection between the color and the shape area, uh, you don't have that kind of cognitive penetration or, or, or feedback from, from higher areas. At least that's supposed to be the idea. Now, what we did in a different Yes. Well, we did a different um, uh, study. It's actually an ongoing study. We're not done with it. Um, was uh, something that was unusual in synesthesia research because most of the, the synesthesia research that's been going on has been uh, involving lately anyway um, any some form of brain imaging. Uh, but very few people had actually looked at um, at people, so the synesthetes own uh, reports, so their own reports of their phenomenology. So we have these tests, as a, you know, the visual search test, the pop out effects, the Stroop effects. Uh, there's the there's an online synesthesia battery. Uh, so there are all these measures, 
Uh, but the, the students' the personal reports or subjective reports of the phenomenology uh, hasn't really been looked at, at least not since the late 1800 or something like that. Um, of course, there were anecdotal reports uh, of the phenomenology, but there was nothing systematic. So what we're doing right now is a more systematic uh, study, which we are revising as we go along, because it's, it's, a, it's actually hard to find the right questions to ask people, given that you, you can't use words like phenomenology or uh, things like that. So <clears throat> some of the... Um, the things that, that is puzzling, one of the things that's puzzling to people who hear about synesthesia, especially graphene color synesthesia, is wait, so you have this black letter, A or H, and it's printed in black, but the synesthete is also seeing it as red. Um, and then if you, are, if, if you don't know your basics of philosophy, you also know, or even just if you think about it, you also know that an object cannot be both black and say red all over at the same time. So this doesn't sound like a plausible thing. So how can how can that happen? So so we started like talking to people, uh, still revising the questions that we're asking them uh, to find out whether that is in fact what's going on. And we have yet to come across a person who would say, oh, the letter. Uh, or the number three is black and green all over at the same time. We have not had anyone agree to any version of that question. Uh, but what they do say, um, they, they say, some, some people say that, for instance, that there's a, is, there's a volume of color hovering over the letter. So that was the case for subject M. So subject M is a projector passing all these uh, other tests uh, and uh, has a specific color, this brownish, orangey uh, color, and said that this was a volume uh, that was sort of hovering over the graphene, right? So, so, the, so the person knows and perceives the letter as black, but there's this volume that is obscuring, partially obscuring uh, the letter. And other questions we asked were things like, does the volume move with your eyes? So if you move your eyes, does the volume actually move or does it, so we're not talk, asking them to turn around, but to just move their eyes slightly, does the volume actually move with your eyes or not? Uh, in this particular case, it didn't move uh, with your eyes. Um, and another important thing that we wanted to uh, know, because the synesthetes talk as if letters have these colors. So when you ask the synesthetes, especially the children, to say like, so what's the, col what's the color of the number three? And they will say, it's green. The, le the, the number three is green. Uh, but when you, you talk to the adult synesthetes, and you say, well, is the, the um, is the, the number, say, or in this case, the, um, uh, the graphene R, is it actually orange-brownish? Does it instantiate? We've used various different uh, variations in that question. Does it instantiate uh, that color? And the answer is basically no. It's not the case that the object of perception instantiates that feature. So, so this is apparently a way that they do talk. They do say, especially when they're children, they say, no, um, R is orange or R is brown. Um, but the adult subjects, uh, when you press them, will say, no, it does not actually visually appear as if the graphene has or that the, the color is instantiated by, uh, by the graphene. Uh, here's, another, here's another example of the subjects. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit different. Um, so just, it's just one of the many uh, graphemes that give rise to colors. Uh, but in this case, you have this greenish yellow uh, associated, well, in this case, projected um, out onto the graphene 2 printed in black. Uh, but in this case, the projection is not 
uh, a volume that's hovering over the letter, in this case, is actually uh, projected out in front of the visual, uh, sort of it, the eyes, in some sense, and it also moves. In this case, it does move with the eyes. So, uh, so when the I'm yes. just trying to understand what that means. So, mm -hmm. the, how can an object not move or not move with the eyes? As in, is oh, it, so it, it, it's it's more like you're. Uh, when I when I use a camera and take a with with a you know with a flash and then I take a picture of you and you get your you know the the, the spots of red spots and they move with your eyes. Um, you mean like a visual after image? Yeah, kind of like an after image. Um, uh -huh. um, it, but but it's not got anything to do with retinal image stabilization or anything like that. I mean, no. so when you say move with your eyes. I'm just not sure. It's it moves with the eyes in the sense that they are only asked to move their eyes a little bit, and it does move with their eyes according to what they say. So, um, so this so we've used various different ways of formulating this, and it's it's clear that it's not um, it's projected out in more like an after image in this particular case. Um, but it's still projector. It's still projector because the experience is as if the the color is outside in the visual field. Uh, so that's the difference from the associator. The associator is not out. Is not experienced as being out in the visual field. Um, so you have a sense of whether it's out in your visual field, just as you, uh, just as you might have in the extreme cases of an after image or something like that. I'm, I'm still. I want to push on this a little bit more. If, so this patient, she, or sorry, not patient, subject B, looks at a black number two, mm -hmm. and that triggers the onset of a greenish yellow volume floating around her fovea. And then she looks off axis from that black two, that greenish yellow volume moves with her eye position. If she keeps moving farther away, she's no longer got the two in her visual field at all. Presumably, the the little volume of color fades because yes. it's not. So it might be interesting to see the, the, yes. the range of eccentricities that this allows. How, how wide is yes. that? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. So, so we don't get that from the uh, subjective report. So we're trying to find out how to actually, I mean, we can get, get something like that from the subjective reports. Um, but we're talking about moving just a, 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 just a little bit. And we're not giving them that specific uh, directions because they think, um, for subjective reports, they can't follow that. Okay. Um, but, but we are we want to find out. Yeah, we want to find out in the, in, in those particular cases uh, when when the fading actually goes on. Um, but yeah, it does fade. Um, so it does need the input. Um, but but you can. But it's 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 more a task. It's more as if it were a task to um, to to the eyes as if. It were an after image of sorts. All right. So, so these are. This is sort of a summary of. Uh, so this is an ongoing thing. We have we have two thousand um, subjects registered, um, and we haven't made it anywhere near <laughs> uh, to the end of that. Uh, and then they're not all graphene colored, by the way. So we can't use them all. Um, and they're certainly not all projectors, but. Um, but so this is uh, so this is an atypical study because it's sort of an 18th uh, end of 18th century method uh, to use, but uh, but one that was kind of missing from contemporary uh, research, uh, and um, and that's uh, that's the case in the, the, this study I'm going to use to as a as a kind of example to um, to representationalism. Um, in philosophy. Okay, so I'm now moving to the slightly more um, philosophical part of this presentation. Okay, uh, so this is a principle that I'm, go I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give you much of an argument for it. I, I will give you a little bit of an argument for it. Um, it's a principle that is already accepted by representationalists, which is why I actually would not need to argue for it um, for this uh, particular talk. Uh, but let me give you a little bit of incentive in, in terms of, of accepting it. Uh, so the principle says that, uh, so 
E is an experience, so if an experience consciously and visually represents O, an object O, uh, as F, um, then visually attending to O regularly and non deviantly causes a visual appearance of O being F. Okay, so, so, uh, so that's, it's, I'm kind of stipulating for the purposes of this talk, I'm stipulating the, the principle, um, it's accepted by the people I'm arguing against, uh, it has some plausibility, and I'll give you a reason uh, also to think that it probably is true. So just an, as an example, um, so I have a tomato experience. Um, the tomato experience represents the tomato as red. If that is the case, then visually attending to the tomato, so on other occasions, so that would regularly and non-deviantly cause uh, the visual experience or appearance of the tomato being being red. Okay, so that's the principle, and I need that in order to argue against uh, representationalism. Let me give you some reason to think that it there's uh, there's some reason to think that it's um, it's a principle you should take to be true. Um, well. What a visual experience represents uh, is grounded in evolution. That's that's um, that's fairly uncontroversial, um, and and of course that's because I mean one reason I could give you is that um, the retinal imprint, of course, is not what 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 the visual experience is, right? So so right now um, um, you're about this big. Right, um, for the retinal imprint, maybe, and you're about this big. But obviously, um, my visual system adjusts for, for those differences and generates um, same sized people around the table. Uh, so that, so that would be a case of, say, size constancy. Um, now, how did that happen? Well, presumably that has to do with well, it has to do with two facts. I mentioned evolution here. Another thing, of course, is early developments, as has been that lots of studies have been carried out with. Uh, you're probably familiar with the kitten experiments, right? Where the kittens were, uh, in one case, where the kittens were, some kittens were actually having little carts uh, behind them with other kittens on them. So the kittens were were not actively exploring the environment, but were sort of passively seeing the environment, so they were sort of uh, just being rolled around the environment, and every soul system didn't develop properly. Uh, there are lots of other kitten experiments uh, that seem to show that early development uh, is important in terms of developing these mechanisms that are involved in, say, size constancy and other other things that you need in order to visually experience uh, the world correctly. Okay, now, so evolution uh, does seem to be uh, important as does early uh, developments. Um, now I'm going to, David Chalmers, you, might, you may know him or you may not know him, uh, he's well known for his, his material and consciousness, but he actually also does have uh, some, a couple papers on perception. Uh, he has a view that I actually don't approve of, but we can use it just to illustrate um, what, I, what I mean by, by this principle, or, or to give a reason for this principle that I just presented. Um, so what David Chalmers says is uh, that when you have a phenomenal property red, Phenomenal property is supposed to be the appearance that you have, internal appearance, appearance of red. Um, uh, so that represents, what does that represent? Well, it represents the color red. And, and for, we can just take red, uh, the color red for to purposes of this talk to be something like, like the reflectance property red that's out in the object. And how does it pick out, how does it represent that color? Well, it's, it does it by picking um, out the property that regularly and non-deviantly gives rise to this phenomenal appearance of red. Uh, his particular view is, in fact, that, that uh, this enters into the content of the, the experience and so on. 
Um, but I'm, I'm not, I don't buy into that, but I do uh, think that this can be used to illustrate um, the principle that I took for granted before. So let me just go back. So this is the princi principle that I think that um, Chalmers' view can be used uh, as, or as a way of illustrating. Okay. Um, okay, so what's your argument against representationalism? We'll just go with uh, subject M. Um, some people have said that cases like subject B are would be better cases, but let me just run through subject M. Uh, so, um, so in um, in subject M, visually attending to R, R is the graphene R. Uh, it doesn't regularly and non-deviately cause a visual appearance of R being this brownish orange. Why not? Well, because um, if her reports are to be trusted, then R is not seen, it doesn't appear to her as instantiating the color. So it doesn't give rise to an appearance of R being that color. There's something in the neighborhood of that, true, but it doesn't give rise to, to it being that particular color. Well, then if we use that principle that I just uh, presented um, a reason for, uh, gave, gave you a little bit of incentive to accept, then the synesthetic experience does not consciously and visually represent uh, R as being, being that particular color. Um, well, but that means then that there are phenomenal properties or qualia that do not flow from the representational content of the experience. Um, and this is because if we go back to, let's just go back to um, this principle again, just to remind you. Um, it, so it follows, it's supposed to follow from this principle that um, if you have an experience that represents an object as being a color, then you have to have this case where the object, um, when you visually attend to it, uh, regularly and non deviantly causes a visual appearance of of that color, which it doesn't do for M. Okay. Okay. So in other words, there are. The, so what I'm trying to get at here is that there are um, phenomenal properties or qualia that do not flow from the representational content of the experience. What would be representational content of experience be in this case? Uh, well, it would be. The, the letter R, right? The letter R being black, perhaps. Uh, the letter R having the shape it has, or the form it has. Uh, but the color is an extra property, and it's something that appeared, that's, that she has an appearance of. Um, so it's kind of a qualia that does not show up in the content, at least not the representational content. It's not something that the letter is representing at, represented as having. Um, so if that's the case, that there are these appearances, visual appearances, as you might also think of when, you, when I say qualia, which is a technical term, there are these visual appearances that do not flow from the contents. They're still part of the experience, but they do not flow from the content. And so reductive representationalism, that was the position that I attributed to Michael Tai at the beginning, uh, is false. Um, now, uh, at this point, this is uh, sort of how one can do experimental philosophy. So you have this very technical, position in philosophy, you do some empirical study, and you use that to argue against representationalism. And I just want to point out, uh, since it was brought up earlier, that that is a bit different from how 
philosophy used to be carried out. So philosophers would traditionally start with uh, their technical position that they want, say, to argue against. And then they would come up with this extremely uh, hypothetical thought experiment sitting in their armchair, not yet burning. And they would uh, say, aha, so there's this hypothetical thought experiment where representationalism seems they can't handle that. OK, now what do representationalists do in the past? Well, they just deny uh, that the thought experiment is possible. So that's, that's something that they very often do. They will, they will say, well, that's not uh, possible. It might be conceivable, but it's not possible. And so it's not uh, undermining my position. When you have uh, some empirical evidence you can present, uh, that's not uh, possible. It's not possible to undermine the particular argument in that way. So, so you actually have, you get a strong argument out of it. Of course, there are possible uh, replies to this. I'm going to skip this particular uh, reply and instead focus on a different reply, which is a little, um, perhaps a little easier to see. So uh, I have given this talk uh, with Michael Tai in the audience, and he actually replied as follows. He said, oh, the representationalist can just say the following uh, for M experience, uh, there is actually a content, and then that gives rise to the phenomenology that she has. The content is, there is this uh, orange brownish volume floating above graphene R. Or in the case of B's experience, there is a bitter line, greenish, yellowish volume floating some distance above the graphene tube in front of her eyes, or so something like that. We can develop on that. So, so in other words, you would say, okay, that's the content of the experience, and so the phenomenology or how things appear to the subject um, um, do flow from from the content, and so representationalism is true after all. Now, this particular response gets a bit technical, and then we'll get to something that's slightly less technical, but. Um, the problem with the response is that um, when you have a representational content, uh, this, is, this is one way, the main way I would say, that representational views differ from, from say, the direct, the relational, the e-realist approaches, and the Gibson or something like that. Um, the difference is that um, content, so if you talk about contents of experience, they have truth conditions. If I'm looking at, at the green crab over there, and I have an experience of a green crab, it had, the content has truth conditions. If the crab is green, uh, the content is true, and so my experience is accurate. If the crab is actually white, and green light is shining on it, uh, then my, the content is false, and so my experience is not accurate. So that's, that's one difference if you have this direct, naive, realist approach. You don't have truth or falsehood. You don't have something like that. You have a direct relational approach to perception. Uh, so this is a similar example to what I just uh, uh, mentioned here. So you have the white table illuminated by red light. Um, but when you have that, uh, so although the content is false, uh, there are normal conditions in which it is true, right? So you can make you could make it true by painting the table, um, for instance. So in other words, uh, an illusory experience, an inaccurate or a misperception, an inaccurate experience or a misperception is a case where. You're, you're seeing an object in some sense, you're seeing the object, uh, but you're misattributing, or your perceptual experience is misattributing the feature to the object. Um, but there are normal conditions where, where the object has uh, the, the feature, or could have the feature. Um, 
But there are no normal conditions where someone has an experience uh, uh, or, or there are no cases, normal cases anyway, where someone has an orange brownish volume floating above grapheme R. We'll talk about abnormal conditions in a second. But these are no normal conditions. Right? It's not a normal condition of perception. Or this one. Uh, there are no normal cases where uh, a bitter lime, greenish, yellowish volume is floating some distance above the gravity tree in front of your eyes. Okay, in normal cases. Yes? Oh, no. Five, Five minutes? Okay. <laughs> it's okay. All right. All right. We won't get to the, uh, to the very end. But um, um, let me just say this. Uh, so... Um, even, I mean, even if you had an abnormal condition, it seems that the phenom phenomenology would be different. So suppose you were, could somehow attach green smoke by a string to your eyes in front of two, it seems that the phenomenology of that would be different. And so, so that's the problem with that particular reply. Um, so this leads to uh, the qualia view, that there are qualia or visual appearances all your visual appearances or phenomenal properties, um, which are sort of more technical terms, that do not flow from the content of experience of representationalism is false. Let me just say a little bit um, more uh, within my next uh, five minutes. So uh, Daniel Dennett is famous for having had a concern about uh, qualia. Uh, that they are private, uh, intrinsic, uh, and, and so forth, and, and that they are problematic because qualia cannot be studied from a third person point of view. His main concern um, is that qualia are private, in fact. Um, his particular solution to that is a kind of behaviorist uh, solution to this and where he thinks that we should not study consciousness or any experience as something that goes on on the inside of subjects. Rather, you should think of um, experience as being something that, uh, um, that if you had an ideal interpreter, the ideal interpreter would look at your behavior and, and would then determine what kind of experience or consciousness you have. I'm going to skip through uh, why private system is not true and go to, in fact, the, um, the second problem because uh, that is more commonly voiced, in, at least recently. Free objection. Okay, so representationalism. Why was representationalism such a big deal? It was a big deal. In fact, Jerry Fodor was very, very excited when Fred Dresky came up with this position, representationalism, and Michael Tai uh, came up with it at the same time. It was, it was, uh, it was thought to be this major breakthrough because you have these qualia or phenomenal character, phenomenal properties, or visual appearances, and it seems like something that's very mysterious, but now if you can reduce that to something that's external uh, to the mind, if you can reduce that to something that's, uh, say, a, a tomato and the property red, then you have bypassed this problem of this mystery phenomenal stuff or qualia. So in other words, you would completely have bypassed Daniel Dennett's concerns about qualia and so on. Um, now, the problem um, with that particular argument uh, is that um, it's true that you actually do reduce uh, qualia or phenomenal properties to something that's external to the mind given representationalism. The problem is that 
the notion of representation still has to be accounted for. And if you have something that's external to the mind, so if you try to reduce phenomenal properties to, say, a tomato and its red property, the property that it instantiates, um, then it's not clear how you get representation after all. Representation is not something that's inherent in the external world. The representation is something that is inherent uh, in either neurological states or, or mental states. And so representationalism is not actually um, a major breakthrough. We'll just get through that. Um, what you need is basically what um, I elsewhere have called like um, the cognitive theory of propositions. Uh, that's a bit technical, but the idea is that you need to account for representational properties as properties of, of the mental states themselves or of uh, neurological states. You, don't, you cannot reduce phenomenal properties to something in the world and also keep the representational or intentional uh, aspect of the, um, of the experience. So, in other words, the virtues of representationalism that philosophers thought that it had, I don't think that, they actually, that it actually has that. And I think that if we need to account for what representational properties are, we need to start with the representational properties rather than reduce it to something um, out in the world. And I'm out of time, so I'll skip uh, the rest here. And yeah.